What are you doing down there? Just standing there? Just filming the main room. Whiskers! <laughs> well, did you know that Whiskers has disappeared? A cat got out. I'm trying to get it. This is one of the most uh, beautifully constructed uh, narrative uh, documentaries, and I really mean that. We're talking like over 100 hours of footage that was assembled by, by a team of editors. There's almost like a fugue-like structure to this film, where you basically start off with initial setup between these two, and past gets brought up almost instantly. Every scene that follows, there's some reference to the past. You know, it's, it's some shade, some variation, and you just dig a little bit deeper every time that they have a conversation. I missed out on everything. I missed out on the reunion of my graduating class in Farmington because that was the fall of Jack Kennedy campaign to get in, and I was stuck here with Mother the Cats, the house, and T. Logan, and I couldn't go. She made me leave the bar because oh, that was... Well, I thought you'd been in New York long enough. You were getting lines in your but face. I didn't you didn't want to leave. I was getting my big chance. Oh, no, you were not. That married man was not Ooh, going to give you any chance at all. You were not. I was going to get it. Well, you didn't get it. You missed out. I was... Farmington was a junior college. You could choose what you wanted to study. Perhaps that was what made my father dislike it so, that I could choose. But I, cho I chose what I thought he'd want me to, to choose. You know, English literature and uh, Oriental philosophies. Another thing I kept getting was Celine and Julie Capoting because um, they're in this house and they keep playing out this thing every day and you kind of get sucked into it and like, you know, and Celine and Julie, they, they go through it three or four times and they fill in the, the blanks a little more every time until you know where they are. And this is what happens here. You know, you start with this kind of weird situation. Why are these people in this house and why do they do this every day? And then it's like, well, in 1952, this, and then this failure here. And, and gradually you begin to understand. Gould and Mother made this record in 1934. He was Mother's accompanist. Their cultural references more often than not skew towards the 30s, the, uh, the body of songs that they keep going through the movies. And then according to little Edie's narrative of her life, it kind of got screwed up around World War II when she didn't get involved in that generational experience. A lot of my friends went overseas and got married. They went in the Red Cross. They went to India, Australia. They all got married. But I never had a chance to do anything like that because Mother wasn't well during the war. Together. Home. Home. You should come home. Well, anyway, she started high pressure for me to come back in March of 1952, and she kept it up until the end of July, July 29th. That's a really fascinating, you know, specific I'm take, you know, there. March 1952. Well, what's going on? Yeah, and they're just able to hone in on that, on that, on that one, you know, moment in time, you know, which may or may not even be accurate. It may just be this, uh, this, this period they latch on to and then their imagination. Well, I think, I think there. it is accurate because they, they've had so much time to hone their grudges that, that, but also, you know, it's just like, it's fascinating how divorced they are culturally. Like 1952, apparently all that happened in 1952 is that she had to leave New York. Yeah. Now that's interesting. You know, like there's a lot of things that happened in 1952. And I guess the beauty of this film is that it, it really gives you a sense of how personalized history can be. And the past is like this thing that keeps getting revisited, but with each revisitation, there, I think there has to be some revision. Uh, Eugene Giskevich, but Mother got rid of him in 15 minutes. Mm -hmm. And he actually proposed under the window. He had no home. He was living in a third class hotel. Under the window. window. He said, Edith, if you want to get married, I'll marry you. And I think that was decent. This gentleman caller that, who apparently proposed to little Edie through the window, according to the commentary track, the Maisels invest, they tracked down this person because they needed to get a release form since he was being discussed. In talking to this guy, I found out that he was just this like visiting salesman who was just there for all of 15 minutes. And, you know, he leaves and then he becomes like part of the the lore of little Edie's, you know, tragic uh, courtship experience. Edie, if your father could hear you, he'd turn in his grave. He'd say, my God, Edie. Apparently this scene happened early in the production. And, yeah, and in the research you pulled up, someone's complaining about that on ethical grounds, which, which strike me as, is, is frank, like, just honestly uninformed, you know, like, you yeah. Know. Yeah, certainly neither the first nor the last documentary to read it uh, chronological yeah, you sequence cannot, for you cannot purpose. treat this film in strict 
linear chronological terms. Like point point being that it, it illuminates something, and like it's not like something happened, like someone died. Like there's no reason to adhere to chronology here. That was another thing that's great about the Maisels is that they were actually going to make a movie out of the footage they had, that they weren't going to call up people and ask them to talk about it, because that would only complicate the issue. This is a two-person POV movie, arguably three with the Maisels. And it's almost like factual verification is besides the point. The point is really the, the mental, the, the psychological realm in which these two people live, allowing the audience to kind of experience the, 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 the blend of fantasy and dreams and disappointments that these people have just kind of ensconced themselves within. We can raise a family! A girl for you, a boy for me. Oh, can't you see how happy we could be? I may need David's hand to get up. You have it. I think we have a, a, a sympathetic amplification sure. of the... Uh, Always. Emotions that the Beals consciously or not present to the Maisels for scrutiny. Towards the beginning, there is a very dramatic zoom in on a portrait of Big uh, at a really crucial moment. And obviously that is not footage that they took right at the second that she was talking about what she looked like. But there's a sympathetic accent where they're willing to make their story even more dramatic than it is. Well, then you were the one with the boyfriend. You're the one who cheated on him with a guy. I don't give a f That's outside Reality TV especially lately, because MTV has been pushing this further and further, it's terrible. I mean, it uses uh, really god-awful music cues and disingenuous musical editing. Talk to your boyfriend. Enough. No, I'm not ready, and I have no makeup on. If nothing else, the uh, Beals are allowed to... Def define their own level of dramatic comfort. There's very little outside cueing. Come on in, we're not ready. And the Maisels make sure to remind you just about every five minutes that they're participants and that they may or may not be coaxing these people and that there's obviously some kind of off-camera relationship that's uh, never going to be deciphered. Well, Al, you're still... Uh, Mother says you're very concerned. <laughs> <laughs> Do you think I'm going to look funny dancing? No. I do terrific dances. The Maisels indict themselves every five, or not even indict themselves, they just remind you. They make a very conscious effort, and it's part of the editing. I don't know. It really comes down to how much credit you want to give to a self-reflexive shot. Just getting up what you call now, a little you're weird. Wasting, you're wasting that thing on this because it's, it's just nuts. The vibe I get is that they are very self-conscious because they absolutely believe in the interpretation they film, put on film. Yeah. They don't want to be called on being abusive about it. They want to say, you know, if you want to call us on this, well then we're reminding you that we're here. But they, I, I don't think there's anything in bad faith about their interpretation of this relationship. But yeah, go, but going back to my question, it's just like, okay, you've got these self-reflexive shots. Other than acknowledging that, yes, we're we're part of this story, but in what way? Uh, you know, you don't see me as I see myself, but but you're very good what you do see me as. I mean, it's not like Frederick Wiseman, who like never, never acknowledges his own presence as a observer. You know, it's always like Heisenberg principle does not apply for him, and he's always like a fly on the wall. I guess what's sort of teasing and, and ambiguous and at times frustrating, at least for me, is uh, the definition of that relationship is never really interrogated to a great extent. And this line right here. That's, that's, I mean, that says, there says so much. But I don't think it, in that context, it's not romantic. He's actually validated, oh, no, it's not, it's not he's validated her uh, experience yeah, exactly. at a remove. What? All I needed was this man, David. Uh, that that that's one of the reasons I have trouble taking the exploitative charges. Like, is, is that really the best people can do? I mean, a, a better question is, did, did the Maisels actually play up the quote-unquote sexual tension between the filmmakers and uh, the Beals? But then, you know, I mean, frankly, no offense anyone, but 
if you were the Maisels, would you want to play up the quote-unquote sexual tension between you and the Beals? You know, it, it just seems like a weird thing to make up, you know? Like, there's plenty going on here without setting yourself up for that kind of trouble. I wish I had David and Al with me before this. Well, then you had your mother. Yeah. But they're 